días, espero que estén todos muy bien. Hoy tenemos el clásico Ateneo semanal del Hospital de Clínicas, primera cátedra de oftalmología de la Universidad de Buenos Aires. Es para nosotros un placer enorme eh, eh, presentar a las nuevas residentes y concurrentes que han entrado al hospital y que han confiado en nosotros para su formación. Virginia Vitar y Delfina Estrada, bienvenidas. Mercedes Bastien, Natalia Gerskowski, bienvenidas. Nuestras nuevas residentes y concurrentes. Espero que podamos serles útiles en su proceso de formación. Bienvenida. Vamos a seguir entonces con el Ateneo, que hoy es bastante variado, porque incluye una presentación desde New York del doctor Douglas Lázaro. Vamos a empezar entonces con la primera presentación que la va a dar la doctora Macarena Clementi, neurooftalmóloga del Hospital San Isidro Melchor Pose. Macarena, cuando quieras, nos mostrás tu, tu caso. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Javier. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Kiara Díaz, por la invitación para hablar en este Ateneo. Para mí es un honor, eh, después de haber compartido tantos años con ustedes, con la doctora Aide Martínez, eh, jefa y amiga. Así que para mí es un placer. Ahí está arrancando a compartir pantalla. Me avisan cuando la ven. Ahí estaría ya en modo presentación. Danos un segundo que todavía nosotros no la vemos. Sí, ahí, ahí está, estaría arrancando. Ahí está. Ahora sí. ¿Ustedes la ven bien? Sí, perfecto. Sí, Macarena. Perfecto. Adelante. Bueno, nuevamente muchas gracias. Eh, les voy a hablar de un caso que titulamos Síndrome quiasmático por aceite de silicón, complicación atípica de cirugía vitreoretinal. Y la historia comienza así. El 17 de octubre de 2017 se presenta la consulta paciente femenina de 75 años derivada por cirujano vitreoretinal, que lo tenemos acá presente, el doctor Andrés Bastián. Eh, quien la ve un feriado, como suelen pasar estas complicaciones, y refiriendo, si bien había sido operada de, del ojo, de su ojo derecho ¿sí? por un desprendimiento de retina, veía mal del ojo izquierdo, con lo cual el doctor decide derivarla para control. ¿Por qué? Porque refería a disminución de visión en el ojo izquierdo en los últimos dos días asociado a cefaleas sin dolor ocular. Como antecedente de enfermedad actual, entonces tenía una vitrectomía con aceite de silicón en el ojo contralateral, al que ahora no veía, ojo derecho, en agosto de 2016. Es decir, 14 meses antes de la consulta, había tenido un desprendimiento de retina e intercurrió con hipertensión ocular de picos de hasta 40 milímetros de mercurio en el postoperatorio. Este paciente había, esta paciente había sido operada en otro centro en el interior del país. Como antecedentes oftalmológicos, presentaba trabeculoplastía en ambos ojos en el año 97 y cirugía de cataratas en ambos ojos. Antecedentes personales, un glaucoma crónico en tratamiento hacía 20 años, también paciente del doctor Javier Casiragui, venía todo bien controlado, eh, complejo vitamínico, hormona tiroidea y por lo demás sana, no tenía ningún factor vascular de importancia. Antecedentes quirúrgicos, Nada de importante, tiroidectomía total, apendicectomía. Al examen clínico de ese día, ese feriado, agudeza visual del ojo derecho, luz sin proyección. Este era el ojo operado de vitrectomía. Y del ojo izquierdo, mejor corregido, llegaba a cinco décimas. Pero ella decía que nunca vio eso, que siempre veía 100%. Le creíamos, por supuesto. Defecto pupilar aferente bilateral en ambos ojos, más acentuado en el ojo derecho, que era el ojo operado, el resto, varias, de las, eh, del examen, varias alteraciones del, del examen físico eran normales, pero eh, tenía la visión del color afectada en el ojo izquierdo, que era por el cual nos consultaba del ojo derecho, francamente con esa visión no era evaluable, al momento de consulta la presión era normal, y al fondo de ojo presentaba megalopapilas pálidas, 
más en el sector temporal del anillo, con una excavación de 1.0 en el ojo derecho y de 0.9 en el izquierdo, y al campo visual del ojo derecho a maurosis y del ojo izquierdo un remanente visual inferonasal. Este era el fondo de ojo que observábamos en esa paciente, este es el ojo derecho y este es el ojo izquierdo. No sé, Javier, si quieres hacer alguna acotación al respecto, si no, sigo mostrando los campos visuales. El campo visual del ojo derecho era maurosis, como decíamos, y del ojo izquierdo presentaba un remanente visual nasal inferior. ¿Cuál fue la conducta en ese momento? Realmente por el examen clínico eh, nos teníamos que plantear diagnósticos diferenciales, pero lo primero que se me vino a la cabeza fue pensar en un síndrome quiasmático, algo a nivel celar o paracelar que estuviera afectando la vía visual, porque la paciente presentaba disminución de visión en el ojo que veía, además tenía alterada la visión del color, además tenía alterados los reflejos pupilares, además tenía palidez de papila bilateral. Con lo cual, lo primero que pude haber sospechado en ese momento era de un tumor celar. Lo que no me cerraba era por qué dos días de evolución de pérdida de visión. Sin embargo, le pido una resonancia urgente de cerebro con isingadolinio, pero tenía que plantearme otros diagnósticos diferenciales por el tipo de evolución que tuvo esta paciente tan aguda. Hay un arterítico, eh, podía ser por la edad, eh, tenía papilas excavadas, claramente no se iba a manifestar con edema porque las papilas ya venían en forma crónica alterada, eh, pero no tenía ningún síndrome, síntoma ni signo de eh, fibromialgia reumática, de igual manera le pide una eritro, una PCR urgente y un ecodoplar de arterias temporales que dio todo normal. Hay un no arterítico, eh, la verdad era difícil de sospechar esto porque no tenía papilas de riesgo, eh, no tenía factores cardiovasculares de importancia, de igual manera le pido de urgencia un ecodoplar de vasos de cuello y cardíaco que arrojó resultados normales, podía haber sido otra vasculitis, eh, podría haber sido, obviamente le pido un laboratorio inmunomatológico, pero hasta tanto tuviera la resonancia y ante estas dudas que realmente me carcomían la cabeza en ese momento, digo, le voy a dar algo de corticoide para por lo menos protegerla. Indiqué una aplicación de un dúo de cadrón intramuscular, y a los días viene con un estudio de laboratorio inmunomatológico que por suerte eran normales, pero la resonancia que por suerte, si bien era del interior, pudo conseguirlo en forma eh, urgente, nos muestra esto. A simple vista vemos que hay alteraciones. Lo que podemos ver en este corte axial, esto es un T1, para repasar T1 de resonancia vemos al vitrio de color oscuro. Este ojo, bueno, por supuesto tenía el aceite de silicón, el ojo derecho, y observamos que hay una imagen muy parecida a la del ojo derecho, no solo en el nervio óptico derecho, sino en el quiasma. Esta es una imagen T1. En un T2, corte coronal, como vemos acá, vemos que en el T2 el líquido cefalorraquídeo es blanco, vemos esta imagen que también es hizo o hiperintensa a nivel intraquiasmático. Esto es raro. Y por último, en esta nueva técnica de resonancia que se decide de realizar en conjunto con la, la gente de Neuroimágenes, eh, se realiza un T1, T1 porque vemos el vitrio que está negro, con gadolinio y supresión grasa. Y esta técnica nos pone de manifiesto, tanto en el corte axial, sagital y coronal, esta imagen que está bien hipointensa a nivel de la cavidad vitrea derecha, que también persiste acá en lo que es el quiasma, y que vemos que la lesión es intraquiasmática. Evidentemente estábamos ante un síndrome quiasmático, como habíamos sospechado, y en este caso podemos decir con certeza que teníamos migración del aceite de silicón. Esto fue descrito, eh, por lo menos las características imagenológicas del aceite de silicón fueron descritas en el año 2012 por Kierkegaard y colaboradores en un estudio de resonancia de 19 pacientes que fueron vitrectomizados y con aceite de silicón y se sabe que típicamente el aceite de silicón en resonancia se puede ver claramente en imágenes de T1 con supresión grasa y gadolinio. La realidad es que hasta tanto definíamos qué hacer con este cuadro, hasta tanto nos dimos cuenta que el aceite de silicón 
Afortunadamente nos llama la paciente y mágicamente ese llamado por teléfono me devolvió el alma al cuerpo, me dice estoy recuperando visión. Solamente habíamos dado una inyección de duodecadrón intramuscular, pero ya a los días empezó a sentirse mejor, con lo cual me entusiasmé y le indiqué tres inyecciones más intramusculares de dexametasona, una por semana, en las tres siguientes semanas, e indicamos en conjunto con el doctor Bastien, el doctor Casirá y una especie de Ateneo, cirugía para extraer el aceite de silicón del ojo derecho. ¿Para qué? Para que no siga filtrando hacia el cerebro. Y lo citamos con nueva resonancia luego de estas conductas. En noviembre de 2017, es decir, un mes después de que lo vimos por primera vez, gracias a Dios la agudeza visual ya estaba en 10 décimas, con recuperación del campo visual del mismo ojo a su estado basal, que era glaucomatoso. Eh, recordemos el primer campo visual, ya en noviembre vemos una gran mejoría y tenemos un estudio posterior de julio de 2019, donde solo se evidencia bueno, este escalón nasal bastante importante, pero una gran recuperación. Y la resonancia que nos trae en noviembre, es decir, un mes después y habiendo terminado el tratamiento con corticoides, vemos como en el corte coronal T T2 eh, no se observa nada a nivel de la región eh, quiasmática, sin embargo, si vemos en los cortes agitales, eh, y en, sobre todo en este corte que es con T1 con su presión grasa y dado línea, la técnica que nos pone de manifiesto el aceite de silicón, miren dónde encontramos aceite de silicón, tercer ventrículo, cuarto ventrículo y en el flare vemos acá el aceite de silicón hiperintenso en cuarto ventrículo y en el cuerno frontal izquierdo de los ventrículos laterales. Entonces... La realidad es que luego de dos años de seguimiento, la paciente se mantiene estable sin haber tenido necesidad de atravesar una neurocirugía. Por supuesto, está con las pautas de alarma, que ante cualquier duda, cualquier dolor de cabeza importante, quizás debamos en algún momento colocar una válvula de derivación eh, ventrículo peritoneal. Pero por ahora viene todo bien y cruzamos los dedos. El aceite de silicón... Sus usos y complicaciones, sabemos que fue descrito inicialmente en el año 62 para el tratamiento de DRs complicados y eh, sobre todo DRs por PBR, desgarros gigantes, algunos casos de DR traccionales. Se selecciona acorde a la patología vitroretinal y la técnica, tiene propiedades físicas importantes, la viscosidad, 1.000 o 5.000 centistoux. El aceite de silicón tiene beneficios, se mantiene en el ojo hasta su extracción. Es benéfico en DRs inferiores, pacientes que no colaboran en los requerimientos posoperatorios de posición y no se afecta por la presión atmosférica. Tiene una muy buena tolerancia hasta los siete meses, pero posterior al mismo se empiezan a describir complicaciones, todas estas, en multiplicación, queratopatía, catarata, hipertensión ocular, cierre de iridotomías inferiores, migración al espacio subconjuntival, al párpado superior generando tosis, toxicidad retinal si bien es rara, pero fue descrita. Ahora bien, lo que nos interesa en el año 83 es cuando vemos que este aceite de silicón entra al sistema nervioso central, por lo menos la primera descripción. Y esta línea del tiempo nos sirve para ilustrar todos los casos previos al presente caso. 10 casos en total que afectaron la vía óptica, 25 en total que, hace, que afectaron al sistema nervioso central con diferentes manifestaciones. Y solamente voy a mencionar los que están en color amarillito, empezando desde el año 2006, para atrás, en el año 2016, entonces Boren y colaboradores en el Journal de Neurooftalmology eh, nos hace un review acerca de la migración retrolaminar del aceite de silicón. No solamente nos hace un review, sino que nos presenta dos casos propios: uno de una mujer de 89 años, diabética, que fue operada de una vitrectomía y aparece luego de episodios de cefalea, deciden realizarle una tomografía y evidencian esta imagen que está hiperdensa en el ojo derecho, que es aceite de silicón, también observan ese tipo de sustancia a nivel de los ventrículos laterales. La cefalea fue por aceite de silicón. Y otro caso de un paciente masculino de 40 años que se presenta también luego de una cirugía de desprendimiento de retina unos meses posteriores con esta sustancia que migra desde el ojo izquierdo hasta el quiasma y nos genera una hemianopsia temporal del ojo derecho, muy parecido a nuestro caso. Para el año 2017, en una re, eh, eh, carta para editor de la revista Journal Neuroophthalmology del año 2017, Boba y colaboradores 
nos describen brevemente, porque era solamente una carta al editor, que tuvieron un caso parecido, que generó un cuadro de cintilla óptica derecha, pero como el paciente estaba prácticamente ciego por su glaucoma, no fue que consultó por su pérdida de visión, sino que consultó por síntomas generales, tenía una parecia del miembro superior izquierdo y ataxia. En cuanto al caso de Lee, Lee tuvo un caso muy parecido al nuestro, que tuvo recuperación espontánea luego de un mes sin tratamiento. Nosotros podríamos haber esperado, puede ser, quizás hubiera mejorado, puede ser, no lo sabemos, yo entré en desesperación porque realmente esa mujer estaba bajando la visión y sentí que algo debíamos hacer. En el caso de Kuhn, yéndonos para más atrás, año 2006, Kuhn nos reporta aceite de, de silicón migrando a través de un pit de papila. La verdad que todo el resto de los casos se adjudicaron a que el aceite de silicón migró al cerebro porque sufrieron picos de hipertensión ocular en el posoperatorio de la vitrectomía. Y no quiero dejar de destacar, principalmente hacer una mención al doctor Eckel y colaboradores, que fueron los únicos que describieron qué hicieron. El resto solamente fueron estudios descriptivos. Eckel tuvo un caso igual al nuestro en el año 2005. Nos muestra este caso de este paciente que tiene, si observan acá, una megalopapila que tenía había sido operado con aceite de silicón en el ojo izquierdo, hace un cuadro, un síndrome quiasmático, con afección del ojo derecho, una hemianopsia temporal del ojo derecho, y ellos no esperaron, no le indicaron ningún tratamiento, fueron enseguida a operarlo, le hicieron una fenestración de la vaina, succionaron el aceite de silicón, y el paciente afortunadamente recupera campo visual y agudeza visual. ¿A dónde fue a parar el aceite de silicón? Con todo esto nos queda claro que se fue para el cerebro. Pero ¿cómo fue a parar el aceite de silicón al cerebro? Y las hipótesis son varias, que, eh, por lo pronto en las que me he planteado y lo que pude encontrar de aval en la bibliografía. En el año 2014, Griboski y colaboradores nos hablan de que el mecanismo todavía está en debate de por qué el aceite de silicón atraviesa al cerebro. Puede ser el mecanismo de presión intraocular elevada, macrófagos o las características anatómicas del nervio óptico, pero concluyen que si hay un glaucoma preexistente o anormalidades del nervio óptico, esos serían los principales factores de riesgo para que esto suceda. Si no tenemos esas cuestiones, no hay ningún problema de seguir haciendo eh, la vitrectomía, colocando el aceite de silicón y no debe ser modificada la técnica de cirugía. La primera persona que describe hallazgos de aceite de silicón a nivel del nervio óptico retrolaminar es la doctora Carol Shields en el año 89, que describe esto que se llama pseudo schnabel degeneration, que son cavidades de aceite de silicón de, atravesando la lámina cribosa. Estas vacuolas son similares a las vacuolas que podemos encontrar en pacientes, obviamente estos son pacientes eh, donde hemos, eh, son pacientes con ojos enucleados, ¿no? Por supuesto, donde se puede estudiar esto. Eh, pacientes que han atravesado un glaucoma agudo y que les aparecen estas cavidades, luego del glaucoma agudo se llenan de mucopolisacáridos y generan una refringencia parecida a esta que nos da el aceite de silicón. Eso que sucede en el glaucoma se llama Schnabel Degeneration, entonces... Carol Shields en este caso le puso el nombre de pseudo Schnabel Degeneration. Siguiendo con esta teoría intraneuronal, es decir, que el aceite migró hacia a través, al cerebro a través del nervio óptico, eh, Bude y colaboradores en el año 2001 nos muestran en cortes eh, también eh, transversales de los nervios ópticos en 74 ojos enucleados, hablan de que hay un 20% con vacuolas de aceite de silicón, que a mayor duración de persistencia el aceite de silicón, mayor infiltración. La duración variaba desde un mes a siete años de duración del aceite de silicón en el ojo con un promedio de tres años y medio, y nos hablaban que, por supuesto, a mayor tiempo, mayor infiltración, y la infiltración variaba de un milímetro hasta nueve milímetros hacia el nervio óptico retrolaminar. No solamente nos describe estas vacuolas, como lo hizo Carol Shields, también nos habla de que existen estos macrófagos adentro de esas vacuolas. ¿Tendría relación con el tratamiento corticoideo que instauramos nosotros? Podría ser. Eh, 
Para el año 2004, PAP y colaboradores nos hablan de, en más en, en detalle acerca de estos macrófagos que quizás tendrían un rol activo, eh, tienen este marcador positivo en estas vacuolas, y se habla de que quizás estos macrófagos entrarían a la arteria central de la retina y podrían quizás en forma embólica generar eh, esta, esta diseminación del aceite de silicona al cerebro. Para ir finalizando las teorías y volviendo al artículo de Boren, eh, en el 2016, él vuelve a refrescarnos la diseminación a través de la vía intraneuronal que habló Carol Shields varios años antes, nos habla de una diseminación probable acá en Violeta a través del espacio subaracnoide, a través de, eh, eh, de licencias o de agujeros a nivel de la lámina cribosa, y también nos habla de otra posibilidad y que es que haya ingresado el aceite de silicón al cerebro a través del conducto por donde entra la arteria central o donde sale la vena central de la retina y los vasos traspiales, o quizás también mediante alteraciones congénitas como el pit de papila que ya fue descrito. Morning glory, coloboma, no ha sido descrito, pero quiero hacer una aclaración respecto al coloboma, que sí hay papers al respecto de un caso de perfluorocarbono que ingresó al cerebro por un coloboma de papila. Y para ir finalizando esta cuestión, ¿qué es lo que haría que hayan eh, agujeros o eh, dehiscencias a nivel de la lámina cribosa? Se, ha, se está hablando bastante de lo que es el gradiente translámina cribosa, entre ellos nos habla el doctor Gauti en el año 2018 y nos dice que hay una relación entre la presión ocular y la presión intracraniana. Que, se alteran, que alteran la homeostasis del nervio óptico. Por lo tanto, se sospecha de mayor daño axonal en láminas cribosas delgadas, característicamente pacientes glaucomatosos, que generarían estas dehiscencias y agujeros de la lámina cribosa por donde atraviesarían hacia la vía subaracnoidea. Somos oftalmólogos, por suerte contamos con un OCT, que es la biopsia in vivo, y que se encuentra alterada en estos pacientes, ya se estudió y se describió y publicó en la revista Retina del año 2015, los hallazgos tomográficos de dejar el aceite de silicón por mucho tiempo, y eh, nos habla de que ahí podemos encontrar eh, edema, eh, perdón, eh, hallazgos maculares microquísticos en la membrana nuclear interna, en los ojos afectados, muy similar a lo que encontramos en en la esclerosis múltiple y la neuropatía óptica de Lever. Y la denominaron en ese entonces neuropatía óptica asociada al aceite de silicón. Como conclusiones, reconocer que existe esta complicación que es infrecuente, el mecanismo por el cual el aceite de silicón migró desde el ojo operado al sistema nervioso no está claro, tampoco su tratamiento. Lo que sí me gustaría tener cuidado ante estos factores de riesgo glaucoma con excavación aumentada y sobre todo si tiene megalopapila asociada, picos de hipertensión intraocular posoperatorios luego de la vitrectomía con aceite de silicón y alerta si disminuye la visión en el, o campo visual en el ojo contralateral, acordémonos del síndrome quiasmático, cefaleas o cuadros de hipertensión intracraniana por diseminación hacia los ventrículos pero siempre podemos apoyarnos en las neuroimágenes y todo lo que hemos hablado de los protocolos ideales para la detección. Pensar que antes uno hacía diagnósticos con un oftalmoscopio directo, una placa de cráneo, hoy por hoy con las últimas tecnologías, gracias a esto podemos evitar terminar en esto. Así que agradecer también porque lo acabamos de publicar en la revista Oftalmología Clínica y Experimental en conjunto con el doctor Andrés Bastien, el doctor Javier Cariagui, la doctora Aide Martínez, el doctor Pedro Lilic y Belén Nagino desde la parte de Neuroimágenes y el doctor Tarik Bati de la Mayo Clinic, quien ayudó a mejorar también la redacción del paper. Así que agradecerles a todos que hemos trabajado en equipo y creo que es muy importante sobre todo eso en estos casos complejos. Muchas gracias por la atención. No sé si hay alguna duda. Muchas gracias Macarena. Me gustaría que Andrés Bastien nos dé algún comentario respecto de este caso tan inusual. Hola a todos, buenos días. Gracias Javier. Macarena, muy, bueno, muy buena la presentación. <coughs> Como siempre, <coughs> básicamente, ahí dijiste factores de riesgo, ¿no? Como bien dijo Javier, es un caso totalmente inusual, pero que los cirujanos vitroretinales lo tenemos que tener presente y a partir de esto todos los oftalmólogos, porque evidentemente esto puede llegar al consultorio de cualquiera, ¿no? Esta señora eh, había sido derivada para simplemente una segunda opinión, y al poco tiempo de llegar, llamó desesperado el marido de la señora diciendo que del ojo único empezó a, 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 tenía un defecto de campo visual y ahí es donde empezó todo. Vino 
sospechando un desprendimiento de retina y en realidad no era un desprendimiento de retina. Entonces, punto uno, causa de pérdida visual sin eh, eh, justificación, eh, inmediatamente interconsulta con el neurooftalmólogo, porque sabemos que el ojo no termina donde creemos que termina, sino termina, como sabemos, en el área occipital, entonces hay que estudiar la vía óptica. Y otro de los factores de riesgo asociados al aceite de silicón es el tiempo. Nosotros, los cirujanos vitroretinales, necesitamos usar el aceite de silicón en más de una oportunidad. Acá Marcelo y, y, y Juan y todo el grupo de retina del hospital lo puede confirmar bien. Por múltiples casos, a veces no, se, no, no lo quitamos en tiempo y forma. Lo ideal son dos, tres meses y extraerlo. Pero a veces hay ojos que ameritan dejarlo durante tiempo indefinido y eso genera muchas veces complicaciones potenciales. Entonces, saber que el aceite es un instrumento que tarde o temprano hay que extraerlo, en casos excepcionales quedará. Y este es uno de los factores, porque el ojo, digamos, este, en cuestión, muy probablemente se le pudo haber sacado el aceite previamente y eso hubiera evitado. Y sobre todo, sobre todo en pacientes claramente glaucomatosos donde tienen un daño del nervio óptico crónico. Y ahí Javier nos puede hablar un poco más de la lámina cribosa y dar da también un poco de idea de, de cómo fue que migró el aceite, ¿no? Pero la realidad es que, bueno, un caso inusual y, la, y es muy bueno compartirlo. Gracias, Andrés. Marcelo Sáenz, ¿querés comentarnos algo? Sí, sí, bueno, coincido con todo lo que dijo Andrés y les aporto excelente presentación, Macarena, como siempre, con una, mucha rigurosidad bibliográfica, con mucho trabajo en la presentación, Gracias. cosa clave. Se ve que lo has preparado y han trabajado el, el, el caso publicado de a todos los autores, felicitaciones. Y además agregar... Otro tema también, hay un paper publicado en la revista Investigate del año 2017 del doctor Tono Roca de Perú, que muchos pacientes, luego de la extracción del aceite de silicón, como dijo recién Andrés, al tercer o sexto mes, o al año, independientemente de la viscosidad en los Stokes, pueden tener pérdida de la agudeza visual post-extracción de aceite de silicón, no por un cuadro de migración, sino por una cierta cantidad de hipótesis. Ellos han juntado casi, en forma retrospectiva, casi 324 pacientes durante dos años y han tenido casi una pérdida de la agudeza visual post-extracción desde un 7 a un 13%. Hipótesis múltiples, toxicidad, neuropatía, hipertensión secundaria, eh, factores de crecimiento, hay un montón. Es un está publicado acerca de la pérdida de la agudeza visual post-extracción, que además es otra de las complicaciones que tiene el aceite cuando uno lo trae a pesar de que no da tiempo, también puede complicarse. Esto es una cosa, como dijiste muy bien vos, muy inusual, muy bien documentada. Ahí pusiste un paper muy interesante del doctor Ralph Eagle, que lo publicó con Carlos Carlos Schiltz. Carl, Ralph Eagle es el patólogo histórico del Wilson Hospital, con la cual hizo ese síndrome que vos describiste muy bien, con la cual es una patología, es una patología de baja prevalencia, muy baja prevalencia, pero bien, hay, hay mucha documentación al respecto desde hace mucho tiempo dos años, o sea que hay que estar advertidos nosotros como cirujanos de retina de que esto nos puede ocurrir aún en baja prevalencia. Bueno, de todos, felicitaciones a los autores por la publicación. Gracias, Marcelo. Solamente, Gracias. Aide, ¿algún comentario? Eh, básicamente, nada, excelente la presentación, y yo creo que eh, es muy importante lo que dijo Macarena al comienzo de todo, y porque ella se planteó la necesidad de hacer una resonancia que era el compromiso, el tipo de compromiso del campo. O sea, la importancia del campo visual y dónde orientó, independientemente de que después, así como manotazo de ahogado, uno recurre al corticoide con frecuencia sin saber muy bien cómo y por qué, que muchas veces nos saca del pozo. Pero eso, la importancia de ver el tipo de compromiso del campo visual en el único ojo que tenía, o sea que no podíamos evaluar los dos, pero que orientó a decir, esto hay que, hay que pedir una resonancia urgente. No era solo ocular. Exactamente. Perfecto, bueno, como conclusión, ante una pérdida súbita de visión de un paciente que llama cuando sea, tenemos que ir más allá del ojo, porque quedarnos en el ojo es ser solamente oftalmólogos y tenemos que pensar como médicos. Así que Macarena, felicitaciones por la excelente bibliografía que buscaste y la precisión con la que nos diste este tema, que repito, es algo inusual. Muchas gracias, Javier. Gracias por la invitación nuevamente. Gracias. Vamos a continuar. Gracias a todos. Eh, eh, Pablo, gracias. Buen día. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas, for, for sharing this morning with us. Dr. Chiara Díaz will present. Hi, how are you doing, Professor Douglas Lazzaro? It's a pleasure to introduce you. Everything's okay? Everything's great. Do you hear me? Hi, like you, 
I'm ready. I'm in, I'm in the middle of crazy patient day, so I'm happy to be here to speak to your group in Buenos Aires, Dr. Casaragi, Dr. Chiaradia. I appreciate the invitation. Muchas gracias por invitación a hablar. Yo tomo la lengua en mi escuela secundaria para cuatro años, pero yo no hablo perfecto. Necesito hablo en, en, en inglés esta mañana. Your Spanish, it sounds great, but uh, let me introduce you in English. Um, again, we deeply appreciate your attitude this morning. Okay, Dr. Uh, Douglas Lazzaro, it's a, a wonderful speaker. He is uh, a cardinal doctor. Let me tell you, um, he, by, by now, he's professor and vice chair of operations, clinical affairs, and business development ophthalmology in Brooklyn. And he's the Brooklyn physician director in the NYU. Uh, you can't imagine how important is Douglas in the cornea world. Uh, not only because he's a, he's a very, very smart guy and he published a lot of paper, he won a lot of awards, but also, but also, uh, Dr. Lazzaro has been involved in residency training program since 1994 and he's and has served in a variety of roles since then. He was director of surgical training in the Kings County Hospital Center for uh, more than a decade, 16 years. And this ophthalmology residency that Dr. Lazzaro directed for 12 years was one of the largest in the United States and was recognized as one of the top training program in the nation. Dr. Lazzaro was elected president of the medical board on two occasions uh, at Kings County Hospital Center. And for three consecutive two years terms was elected downstate president of the university faculty practice plan. Uh, Dr. Lazzaro serves on the Medical Advisory Board of the iBank for Site Restoration. Here uh, at the Buenos Aires University, uh, we were talking about this issue with Douglas. Uh, we have a lot of problems, uh, but also we share some issues. And for us, it's a truly honor that you joining this morning. And thank you again, Douglas, for your nice presentation. Let's start whenever you want. You can share the screen. Thanks. Is my screen on? It should be. Yeah. It's screen. Perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Thank okay. you for that great introduction, Pablo. It's good to see you again. And I'll try in the next 30 minutes or so. I, this talk is about an hour and a half, but we're going to condense it to about 30 minutes. I have Take no relevant time. Yeah. Take your time, please. Thank you. So we're going to talk about peripheral ulcerative keratitis. It's a disease that I've had uh, a lot of referrals for over the years. And it's import an important entity because if not treated appropriately, there's significant risk of loss of vision. I'm going to try to tell you what the definition and presenting signs are, talk about pathophysiology, recognizing some of the differential diagnosis and co most common etiologies. Some of the treatment modalities, we'll talk a little bit about treatment in the middle of the talk and then talk about some of the newer treatment uh, concepts, at least for rheumatoid associated PUK. And lastly, how to be an RD, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So what is PUK, peripheral ulcerative keratitis? It's a group of destructive inflammatory disorders that involve the peripheral cornea. You can see in this area, nice, nicely demonstrated an ulcer that's taken away epithelium and a part of the stroma. And it's juxtalimbal. It always starts juxtalimbal. There is an epithelial defect. And by definition, you have loss of some of the stromal tissue. And based on the inflammatory process and what your interventions are, will determine how thin this area is and how dangerous it is 
to allow the patient to either go home, admit, possibly do ur urgent surgery. There is always inflammation of the conj, episclera, and sclera. And about 50% of these are related to systemic diseases. What's important is you might only get this local area, but in certain severe cases, particularly untreated ones, you'll get circumferential disease as well. And what the main issue is in, in untreated case, you can get melts and basically end up with an eye that has a hole in it. Sorry, Douglas. Perhaps something is not going perfect in your presentation because it's not running the slides. You, you don't have the slides. We can see, but it's not running at all. So it's easy. You just... How about that? On the, on the screen. I'm on, on the, it. It's on share screen. You, you, you have to put the, 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 the whole click, screen. Click in enable editing. It is. It's on everything here. Okay. Write down of your screen. Right. Write down. It's, it's, it should be advancing. <clears throat> okay. Mati, if I can do it. It should okay. be. It's uh, usually in your screen to share what's going on with your PowerPoint or Keynote. There is just a button. Yeah, I'm on the, it. In the right down square. Right. Let me just, it should be sharing. Let me just go over this. Sharing perfectly. Or share. You're getting no share, huh? It's shared perfectly, but you should click on the right down. Yeah, I'm on it, but and it and it says I'm screen sharing. Yeah, exact in the I don't know how you say the screen down now. It is screen. Let me just the full screen, Pablo. Full screen. Yeah, screen. it's on. It's on full screen too. You're still not seeing it, right? No, no. You you, you can put it at, at the top, at the bottom of your screen. You can find a, 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 a small say the, when when you have the arrow now. Dice que dice que lo está apretando, pero que no le aparece. The other word. Nosotros no lo vemos. It's, it, it is basically saying that I'm totally sharing. I don't. Let me just get my staff in here. One second. La otra es Can continue. Excuse me, doctor. The, the other option is to press the F5 button. The F5 button. I'm doing it. Are you in your office? <clears throat> Down here, I'm trying to screen share and come on over. It looks like everything's on. Um, I think that you should first click on the enable editing button on top, on the yellow oh. bar. Okay, at the top, at the very top. Is, okay, I said enable. Right, I had that. And now, now you can share. Yeah, I, it, it, it's coming up, at least that it's shared. Um, Enable content. Thanks. They're not seeing the lecture. They're not seeing the slides. Enable content. Yeah, we did that. We've done that. Right. Let's get help, but it looks like it's supposed to be sharing. I've done enable. How about now? Can you guys? The way is perfect. Thanks. No. One. Uh, in display settings, you have to change to duplicate Im image. 
display. Let's go to display maybe. Yeah. Oh, actually, let me see. I don't know. Let's try. Can you see it? Perfect. Again? Perfect. Oh, it's perfect. It's going very, very well. Thanks. This is what we see. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting. It's got a dual, a dual action here, so it's not sharing it on one. I don't know why. Okay. Let me just advance now. We appreciate it again. Thank you. It's perfect now. Okay. Let's see if it advances though. Good. Yeah. Let's start. Okay. Okay. Let's start again. Thanks. Sorry. You, you saw this slide. We'll move to here. So peripheral corneas adjacent to the limbus. Arcades extend into clear cornea. And the peripheral cornea is IgM and complement. It's a setup for inflammation peripherally. And in the end, you get circulating immune complexes, immune deposition, and complement factors that basically produce collagenases. In addition to that, you get a vasculitic process, and it causes damage to the vessel walls, and it culminates in peripheral tissue loss. Now, what's, what's important is that it can be the presenting problem in collagen vascular disease up to half of cases, and Tauber showed nicely that non-infectious cases, in 50% of those, they're associated with collagen vascular disease. And what's important to note, there's an associated scleritis in many of these cases. Another important study showed that about 83% of these cases have unilateral disease, and males, for some reason, have a little bit more incidence than females in this disease entity. So what are the history points that you have to look at? One is past medical history. We'll get into that in a little bit. Is the patient immune competent versus immunocompromised? Do they wear contact lenses? Have they had history of trauma? And what's their occupation? And we'll talk a little bit about those as we move on. What's a basic workup? Always make sure to rule out infectious disease. If you're suspicious for infection, perform cultures. And these are some basic laboratory tests you might want to order in, in, a, in a generic sense, but you're going to tailor it to your history. These patients present with pain, tearing, light sensitivity. Vision is not always down. It depends on whether or not the central area is involved. If the area is just peripherally and it's an early case, Vision can be perfectly intact 2020 with no real issue. And there's a variable degree of stroma loss, as mentioned earlier. It depends on what the process is and what the treatment intervention is. And you need to differentiate these cases from things like pellucid marginal or terians, where they're really non inflammatory conditions with intact corneal epithelium. There are clinical findings that go with some of these diseases. So we will touch on some of these and I'm happy to share the slide presentation, but these are some of the clinical findings that you see with some of these diseases. Rheumatoid arthritis, relapsing polychondritis, polyarteritis nodosa. Again, it's 30 minutes, we won't go into everything. These are some of the lab tests you're gonna consider if you're wanting to hone in the diagnosis, like Sjogren's or lupus, you're going to add specific blood tests to try to get the diagnosis. This is one way of looking at PUK, ocular causes versus systemic causes. Again, under systemic infectious diseases, we'll touch on some of the common ones, and then we'll go into more closely some of the connective tissue disorder we will spend a little time on Morin's ulcer because you'll see a number of those cases in your, in your careers. And we'll also touch on rosacea. What about biopsy? How often should you do biopsy? Well, this can happen. You can consider this if you think you're dealing with autoimmune disease and you don't have a systemic disease yet, but you think from the history that there might be a systemic disease. 
And what's interesting to note is that PUK can be the presenting manifestation of an occult vasculitic disease and may precede your systemic diagnosis by a number of years. So these are the immune systemic diseases that we think about. By far in the list, rheumatoid, rheumatoid, rheumatoid leads the list. Most of these are unusually associated with PUK. So rheumatoid is by far the most common immune disease. And you can have a painless guttering where you'll see infl inflammation right at the limbus. And it may be with inflammation, maybe without inflammation. And RA in a study by Tabor, as mentioned earlier, is responsible for 34% of non-infection puck. And what's important to know is if you have rheumatoid and destructive PUK, there's a reduced life expectancy in these patients. How do you diagnose rheumatoid joint disease x-ray? Note that rheumatoid factor is not always positive and can be seen in other autoimmune diseases. Here is ANC-associated granulomatous vasculitis. These patients are really sick. They're going to be in the hospital. They always have contiguous sinus disease when they have ocular involvement. And when they do have ocular involvement, 60% of them have puck as one of the manifestations. And what you should note is this is different from what was mentioned earlier. Many of these really sick hospitalized patients do have bilateral puck. Again, unusual from the usual puck, which is 83% unilateral. Polyarteritis nodosa, you may never see a case. I've seen one case of pan associated with puck, so we won't spend a huge amount of time on it. SLE, you should note that rarely causes puck. The most common manifestation is keratoconjunctivitis seek, a really bad dry eye. Some of the lab tests that you're going to look for if you're looking for lupus. And relapsing polychondritis, I've seen a few cases in my career. It's very rare. It rarely is associated with puck. These patients come in with floppy ears, and they usually succumb from cartilage collapse from uh, from loss of that cartilage in the airways. Let's go back to rheumatoid because it's by far the most common of the immune diseases calling puck. It can be associated with a keratitis, with or without scleritis, and you can have furrowing that we mentioned earlier, with or without inflammation. Puck, when it's associated with rheumatoid, is almost always associated with necrotizing disease, and it has a prognosis that's guarded. These are some cases of puck in rheumatoid arthritis. You must treat these patients with immunosuppressants. If you don't treat them appropriately, there's almost a 50% to 60% mortality rate at 50 years. These are some basic rheumatoid treatments, treating dry eye, treating scleritis, collagenase inhibitors are important. Resection is kind of controversial. Some people believe in it. I, I do do resection at times, but there is the risk of inducing more inflammation if you resect the conjo off the limbus, but it can be used if things aren't going in the right direction. And you always have to immunosuppress these patients. So what are some of the treatments you can consider? If the patient you don't think needs to be hospitalized, this is the oral prednisone dose I use. If you think it's a really bad melt and they may not be very good with compliance. You can admit them for a few days of IV steroids to get things under control. It's going to take four to six weeks, closer to six weeks to immunosuppress these patients. So if you're going to put them on methotrexate or one of the biologics, you got to get them on steroids at least for the first six weeks and then taper off as the other medicines kick in. Here's a case of a 60-year-old with joint inactive quiescent rheumatoid that presented to the Brooklyn VA with pain and redness and was diagnosed with scleritis and PUK treated with topical drops. It's important to note that she was on adalimumab at the time of presentation at the VA. She was transferred for to, to our city hospital and had 95% thinned area here and associated scleritis. 
and you can see that there's a fibrinous response in the anterior chamber. And you can see the loss of luster of the cornea from the severe keratitis cica. She had a little bit thinning in this area as well, but you couldn't see it well on slides due to this fibrinous exudate in the anterior chamber. This is what she looked like when she looked down after three and a half months of increase in the methotrexate to 20 milligrams on, uh, on a weekly basis. Prednisone was up to close to 80 milligrams. She was a heavy woman and she continued to be on adalimumab and she got glue in this area with a bandage contact lens and she actually had a, a pretty good response, was quiet for two years and then walks in on a Friday afternoon with a knuckle of virus in her cornea and was fairly asymptomatic. She said, I, I think the eye's not right. She had a little irritation and needed a tectonic penetrating graft to secure the globe. I wanna mention first glue. I think glue can be your friend in these cases. I use a lot of glue. It's not always easily available to get histocryl, but Dermabon, you can get just about any hospital ED. Dermabon is pretty safe. It's one of the- Can I ask you something about this patient? Can I ask you something? Absolutely. Yeah, please. Uh, when you decide, go to the OR, to the operating room with a patient like this. Glue, okay, I, 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 I strongly agree, but tell me about amniotic membrane. It's useful or what can you say? So we can get into that a little later in the talk, but yeah, I, 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 you can't use just amniotic membrane here. I used glue and I used folded amniotic membrane. Now, some of these patients are not going to respond if they're not immunosuppressed quickly enough, and you're going to end up having to support the tissue with corneal, you know, corneal supply from your eye bank. But I have found in these cases, glue and folded amniotic membrane from biotissue works pretty well in getting you over the hump. I'll show you another case later on in the presentation, Pablo, where glue was a good friend to get me from point A to point B without actually having to put corneal tissue in the eye. But yeah, amniotic membrane, I will use a fair amount, but not in and of itself because uh, it won't protect the integrity of the globe. Okay, great, thanks. And sometimes people were talking about this Foster Cytoxin cycl Cyclophosphamide protocol. To be honest, in 20 years, I have not had to use this protocol. It's extremely complicated. And some of the newer modalities, which we'll get into briefly, um, have allowed me not to have to go into cyclophosphamide. I don't recall a case in the last 20 years that I've had to use cyclophosphamide. Back to some of these other non-rheumatoid immune diseases, just briefly. Systemic lupus erythematosus, we mentioned PUK is rare, it's dry eye. These patients respond well to plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. And this is a typical ulcer seen with a lupus patient. We've had a couple of these in the last few years, but it's very unusual. You, you may or may not see those in your career. Polyarteritis nodosa, I've actually seen one case in my career. What's interesting is the PUK that you will see in PAN in this report in the literature is similar to Morin's, but always has scleral information. That's important to differentiate it from Morin's and we'll touch on Morin's in a little bit, but Morin's inflammation, there's no underlying systemic disease and no scleritis. This is a case of, of Morin's also coming on in a second. These patients do respond well to resection and again, have to be immunosuppressed. This is a case of a Morin's peripheral ulcer. ANC-associated granulomatous vasculitis, previously known as Wegener's, these patients are really sick. They're usually in the hospital already with sinus disease and puck is a not uncommon manifestation of these eyes. 
And these patients, you're going to diagnose with C anchor and uh, some some biopsies occasionally, but usually these diagnoses are, are already made systemically, and you're going to be called in because they're they're having severe inflammation in one or two eyes. This is a case of an anchor associated hospitalized patient with PUK, and another case of PUK with ANC, and then a scleral melt from anchor. What about Sjogren's? Sjogren's is kind of a rare disease that's associated with peripheral disease. I don't think many of you have probably seen Sjogren's. It can have a primary you know, etiology where you don't find anything, but certainly can be associated with some of these other diseases. And you can look from serum antibodies when you see these tests, look for positive ANA, anti-Rho, anti-Low disease, anti-Law. You know, I, I made this presentation about seven, eight years ago uh, before some of the new year, newer meds. And this is the first case I actually saw of a Sjogren's case. It was in the clinic when I got back from Albany. And you can see here, there's a peripheral keratitis and there's a severe thinning of the sclera, which was a Sjogren's associated, primary Sjogren's, no underlying disease. And again, you have to immunosuppress these patients. These cases you'll see once or twice in your career, and they're associated with a number of other things, but these patients, as mentioned earlier, they get inflammation of the respiratory tract, you know, uh, cartilage, and this is where they usually system, uh, they have problems systemically and they die from laryngeal collapse. They also will sometimes come in with floppy ears and saddle nose deformity, again, from the cartilage that's abnormal. Let's touch base on Morin's ulcer, which you'll see a number of cases in your careers. Um, these tend to be pretty painful eyes. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Unilateral is associated more with trauma. And there's no infection or collagen vascular disease when you work these patients up. They have an interesting ulcer where you get blood vessels from the limbus growing in, and we'll talk about an overhanging gray edge, which you occasionally see. There was some thoughts in the, in the uh, 70s and 80s about uh, possibly being associated with hepatitis C, but in a nice New England Journal study, uh, it was really disproven. So there's really no associated with hepatitis C, so I don't get hepatitis C levels on these patients. Morin's always begins in the periphery there's a gray overhanging edge so that if you're looking at the ulcer from inside the center of the cornea, you can look into the, into the crevice. And the sclera, as mentioned earlier, is rarely, rarely involved. What's the treatment? Well, contact lens sometimes, if progressive and it's going around peripherally, circumferentially, you're gonna consider resection and you may, not, you may need to put some corneal tissue and even conjunctival flaps. We had a nice talk from Ed Holland last night about, you know, about protecting the cornea. And part of the discussion was about conj flaps and that younger residents are really not taught about conj flaps. But in cases of isolated peripheral melts, particularly that don't involve the visual axis, these conjunctival flaps, which I will do occasionally, brings in some healing sometimes to that area and you can get you through the thin cornea. And of course, you're not gonna see through the vascularized area, but if it's out of the visual axis, the small area peripherally can be of some use. What about autoimmunity in Morin's, even though you don't find an underlying disease? Well, Bartley Mondino and Stuart Brown did find in a nice study in the 70s, circulating antibodies to conjunctiva or corneal epithelium. So there's certainly some immune basis for the disease, but there's no underlying systemic disease. There's a case in mind of really severe Morin's ulcer. Another case, you can see the destructive nature of this disease. Another couple of cases. There's a case of 2014 seen at one of our public hospitals. There's the right eye. Guy comes in, he's, he's not really a 
guy that likes to come to the hospitals and you can see a really thinned area here, another area here that's thin. Here's a magnified area of the right cornea. Again, on magnified view. And then he's got some peripheral disease in his left eye. Again, magnified. So he's got bilateral disease. We admit him for IV steroids for three days and followed by oral steroids. He actually quiets down within a few weeks. But after getting his eyes quiet, he comes back two years later, never coming back. And he's got a left eye ulcer that's all of this area. So it's a pretty large area that's now thinned. And you can see on a higher mag, the level of loss of tissue. And so he has, and Pablo asked the question, we put a ring on that day in the clinic, my cornea staff, started him on prednisone and got him a rheumatology consult. They did a large workup and this non-specific inflammatory market was elevated, but no underlying disease. And on day five, this ulcer perforated. And he underwent a PKP. This is the end of, of, end of November, 2016. And these cases are difficult to transplant. You know, you don't, you don't have an anterior chamber. Um, they're tough cases. Post-op day three is a wound revision. They put another procure. I'm not involved at this point. They get the AC formed and they put him on the topicals. He's again on high dose prednisone. And this is week one. He's got a little vision back. He's got a pressure. He's got a little anterior chamber. He's Seidel negative. And he's starting to be tapered a little bit from the prednisone. And then uh, day nine, he's got another leak. And this is the kind of the type of course that is not unusual when there's underlying, you know, immune process going on and there's melting until you really immunosuppress them. They can, they can basically thin again and leak again. So we get some glue, bandage lens, and then he's lost for follow-up again and doesn't use any medicines, doesn't use drops. And he comes in, he's got a grafty hissance, and the AC's flat, and he's got a suture that's broken. And so he needs uh, some more surgery. And he basically has some stitches here, you can see, and he gets a lot of glue, and he gets a large diameter lens. And now he's given IV steroids. He's on methotrexate, and the plan is to you know, initiate infliximab. But the problem is this guy doesn't show up all the time and this is an infusion medicine. But we're planning on starting this medicine. The story doesn't end here. Here it is up close. He's got a lot of glue and, you know, you're close to losing this eye. He's still got a form chamber and he's worked up a second time. And again, he's he's got a slightly high complement level, but everything else is negative again. And there are no organisms. And now he comes in the day before New Year's and he's leaking all over and basically gets glue placed all over here to try to at least stop the, the leak until he gets a PK in the next 24 hours. And then of course he gets into another physical altercation, hitting the back of the head the graft is dehissed previously, sutures are loose, and he's got to go to the OR again. So this is third graft, and uh, he needs an anterior vitrectomy. His lens is partially out, so he gets a lensectomy. And um, this is the overall complicated course, which included multiple PKs, vitrectomy at the end. The bottom line is, you need a compliant patient. These cases are really tough to, to solve. And uh, sometimes if you don't have a compliant patient, you're gonna lose these battles as best as, best as you, you try not to.
what's some of the difference between PUK and Morin's? Mentioned earlier, Morin's extreme ocular pain and no scleral involvement in the vast majority of cases. And you got that typical overhanging gray edge. These are some of the other entities that can cause some peripheral disease, and we'll touch on some of these briefly. Staph marginal, you'll see in your office, you have this clear zone between infiltrate and limbus. Usually there's no epithelial staining, there's no ulcer, and there's no progression. These cases are pretty straightforward to treat. Um, you treat them with topical antibiotic and steroid, there's no staining and they respond pretty quickly. And uh, usually in a few days, here's another case of some staph marginal disease, you see these staph infiltrates. Again, they, they respond very quickly. Here's a case we presented of a peripheral lesion in a diabetic that uh, had no underlying systemic disease. There was a little bit of thinning. And uh, on culture, this came up with some interesting organism that's really only seen in diabetics Xenotrophomonas multifilia, we published the case because it's kind of unusual, but that's a peripheral ulcer with a little bit thinning from a, uh, from a diabetic infectious ulcer. This is a guy that presented to me after having some irritation for a couple of years. He's got a lot of inflammation. He's got some thinning in this area as well as the right eye. And this was occupational. He was a cleaning, lay, cleaning gentleman in the uh, Columbia University Medical Center, was using very toxic chemicals for about 15 years. This is an interesting case. You see this massive superior vascularization and inferior vascularization here. And the history on this case is that, sorry, I'm not advancing. Let me go back. The case here is this woman had a uh, refractive surgery case. She was an anesthesiologist and post-operatively post developed a three-diopter irregular astigmatism actually in both eyes. And she had no, no preoperative signs when the original doctor did her refractive surgery. But she could not see well enough as an anesthesiologist. So she went to gas permeable lenses for a while. And then she went to the Boston lens that Perry Rosenthal has uh, popularized. And she had to wear these lenses 14, 15 hours a day to get through a work day in anesthesia. And after 14, 15 hours of, you know, six months of use, she developed this peripheral keratitis. She had to come off lenses for a while to have this resolved. And that brings up the question of contact lens ulcers. This is a nice case of Brock Blakewell of a uh, peripheral lesion. It almost looks like a flectenule, but it's actually due to a, a rigid gas permeable lens that doesn't fit well. It's a uh, well-known entity called contact lens or vascularized limbal keratitis. There is a clinical entity that's been published by uh, Ed Holland and some of the folks in Cincinnati where you get this hypertrophic epithelium. They look like pterygium, almost like this, but they're not pterygium. If you scrape them off, and even if you put an amniotic membrane, they're not going to do well. So those cases can also look like this, and they're separate from pterygium or this entity because there's no contact lens use. There's a lady with a male with glaucoma that presented with a peripheral ulcer, and this was, again, infectious, presumed, and does well with the topical course of antibiotics. Let's touch on Terrians briefly. You will see some cases. This is not common, but you will definitely see some cases, particularly if you work in a corneal clinic. What's striking is the lipid line that you'll see anterior to the thinning. You'll get against the rule of stigmatism. It's more common in men than women. It's a young patient's disease. And they can perforate if they're super thin. And you get these two types of younger with a little bit of inflammation and older with quiescence. But most of these cases are certainly quiet eyes. This is my best case I've ever seen of, of Terrians. You see there's a pretty significant thinning here. And you can see that beautiful demonstration of anterior lipid, anterior ulceration. These cases may require 
tectonic tissue. Pellucid is probably in the you know, same spectrum as keratoconus, bilateral inferior thinning, where you get a protrusion above the thinned area and you get this you know, from four o'clock to, to, to eight o'clock thinned area and it's, they're in non-inflamed eye, the very steep corneas, it begins the rule of stigmatism and you get this typical topography with uh, typical topography with uh, pellucid. Let's touch briefly on herpes simplex and varicella zoster. These can present in the eye with no dermatologic findings. It's not common. We always think about herpetic corneal disease as a central corneal disease, but it can certainly present peripherally. I'll show you a couple of cases. What about zoster? We're currently running a study of zoster with the zoster eye disease studies. We're the uh, central center for it. I, I have not seen varicella in the acute or even in the chronic phase with peripheral keratitis. This is really the only article you'll, article you'll find in the literature, four cases from 78. So it's really rare. If you have a case of zoster with a peripheral keratitis, you can write it up because it's almost never seen. Let's talk herpes briefly. We all gonna recognize this case. And this is a case of limbal vasculitis from herpetic disease. There's another case where you get peripheral disease from herpetic disease. And we'll talk briefly about this 28 year old male who's been seen recently, comes in and he tells me, I've been told they have conjunctivalization of the left eye. I've got some atrophy and I'm coming for a second opinion. And he had a little discomfort, but his vision's pretty good. This is in August of this year. So just a couple of months ago, you can see how good his vision is. He's been on Valtrex twice a day for about a year. And this is what his eye looked like. He had some vascularization here and here with some thinning. He had little disease here, hard to capture all of the areas. Here it is on magnification after we put him on some pred, prednisolone and upped his Valtrex. And he's feeling better. And the eye's pretty quiet. Of course, he's got this vascularization. He's, his vision's intact because his central cornea is pretty good. He's got irregular topographies. This is an interesting case of a 23-year-old female referred in March of 2018 with 20-20 vision, but cloudiness in the left eye and had gone to an ophthalmologist a month earlier. And this is how she presented to me. And I called up the referring ophthalmologist who's an ex-resident of mine. And I said, how did she look, you know, when you saw her? So let me show you, if you see this case, you're not really sure what's going on, but if I show you this, you'll see that this is how she looked a week prior to seeing me. So she can see this faint, what looks like a dendrite here and staining in this area. It's a case of herpetic. And this is when they put her on Zergan five times a day for about two weeks, she quieted down. She's actually been pretty quiet for a couple of years now. Rosacea, I think you got to think about because it's underdiagnosed. It affects about 16 million Americans and type four is the ocular subtype. There are four types of, of rosacea and it's a chronic cutaneous inflammatory disorder of sebaceous glands that it can cause a lot of different parts of the eye to be affected. And we always think about it with meibomian gland dysfunction and lid disease but you can certainly get episcleritis, conjunctivitis, and vascularization of your cornea. And this is the typical rhinophyma. This is not the typical patient that walks in with rosacea. This is a case of rosacea keratitis with vascularization. This is a middle-aged guy that came in. You'll see him close up here with a peripheral keratitis from rosacea. And this is after maxitril and doxycycline did not need to be immunosuppressed. After the drops, you can see that whole area is completely quiet. Again, it's pretty quiet. 
What are some of the therapies with tetracy with uh, rosacea? Flagyl, which is metronidazole and tetracyclines. I usually use doxycycline, which works well, and then avoid triggers. And there are some articles about topical cyclosporin. And um, people still actually don't know why patients get disease from rosacea. There's some theories about toll-like receptors and expression of adhesion molecules, molecules, as well as this increased level of an angiogenesis marker in the arterioles. There's a nice article from survey by Ted Willetis from Albany, who's an oculoplastics person. It's a nice, nice article. It talks about some of the current thinking. There's also an upregulation of this peptidase 5, which activates another protein, which then initiates reaction from leukocyte cytokines and mast cells. And it's interesting, there are a couple articles in the literature about bromonidine showing some actual activity to dampen the response in rosacea. I actually haven't used it yet, but I'm going to use it on my next rosacea patient. This is a 72-year-old with a history of inferior keratitis. This patient actually has lid disease. This is some staph disease. Again, we're going to go through some different cases. This is, again, the same case of staph marginal disease, easy to treat. This is an interesting case that presented to me a few years ago, 41-year-old with a history of diabetes and had this inflammation in the right eye. You can see the vision's pretty good on a bunch of medicines, including metformin for his diabetes. And other than his cornea, his eye exam looked pretty good. He had this bilateral, not bilateral, this right eye, nasal and temporal keratitis. Left eye was okay. You can see the thin vascularized area on high mag. And this is the temporal part of the disease. We scanned him and he had this abnormal echoes over here, increased OCT echoes. And we did a review of the literature, and I'll show you why. If you look closely at that patient, there were actually crystals in his corneal stroma. And so this was a case of gout-associated keratitis. It's not that common. And there's some nice articles in the literature about gout in the eye. And the most common things are probably deposits of crystals in the conjunctiva. It's pretty rare to see it in the cornea, but um, I'll point you to this article, which has all of the findings. And uh, this is in their article where they had white crystals and some of the tophi and the ant some of the gout in the anterior segment. And this is Walter Stark paper where ultra, ultra high resolution looking at them on the iris. Again, crystals and gross Gross McClough again with some pathology of one of the areas here in this patient. So the Ferry article I referred to earlier, there was no uveitis. Some people have reported uveitis and there was redness as one of the common things and some conjunctival findings. This is a review not in the eye literature that looked at some of the uh, findings of eye and gout and those are some of their reported findings. Our patient, if you look closely, there were crystals in this part of the cornea, not, not nasally. You can see them here faintly. When you see them on high mag, there were crystals in the cornea. And we put the patient on PO prednisone, and the eye was pretty quiet. We published this report because it's a pretty unusual case. And there's a whole review of the gout literature with this. This is a diabetic patient that was presented to me that had routine pterygium surgery, and she had this peripheral ulcer. And this was basically a non-healing, deep defect from diabetes. And I always try to tell the residents, diabetes is a serious disease. And if you're going to do refractive surgery on them, they sometimes don't heal their epithelium. And uh, they can have persistent epithelial defects with typical routine scratch corneas.
and there is pathophysiology behind it. And so that's, they don't, they don't have normal healing of basement membranes. Diabetics with LASIK, much higher risk of having post-operative complication of the epithelium, again, because of the problems. This is a case of a flictenual. This is a recent case of a 73-year-old male who's healthy. Guys on no medicine, ex-veteran, and was referred to me with a uh, blurry left eye and a painful eye. You can see this massive ulceration here. He'd been in Pennsylvania for a month and uh, he didn't have a lot of pain with that, interestingly. You can see this the pulling in there and it's about 95% thin. We actually cultured him, it was negative, blood test negative, he'd had to work up previously. We put him on oral antivirals, doxycycline, topical antibiotics, and we glued, we literally Pablo glued that area, knowing that we might have to go in in a couple of days. And uh, this is about uh, a few weeks later, he starts vascularizing. It's just a few weeks ago. Hi, Mag. September 8th. And you can see this area is filled in. And this area on September 3rd was a little bit thinned, but is now filled in. Hi, Mag. Cornea is a little bit cloudy, so his visions count fingers, but he does not now, he does not have any thinned area. And this is last visit. Um, just last week, and he's doing pretty good. The eye's quieter, and there's no more thinning, so we got away without having to put some tissue in there. This is what he looks like. He's got a really bad case of rosacea. We have no other explanation. Been worked up carefully, but this is an undiagnosed rosacea keratitis. We're keeping him doxycycline. This is a gentleman that just presented to me about three weeks ago, and uh, someone referred to I think I have a case of PUK. In fact, this was not PUK. This was an interstitial keratitis and uh, it's most likely herpetic. There was no thinning and no staining in the area. So this was not a case of puck. This is another patient present 50 year old with rheumatoid, known rheumatoid and uh, was already on methotrexate, a pretty fair dose, steroids and one of the biologics. And this is what he looked like. I just got to see the time. I'm being screamed at by my staff, but I'm going to try to get through in a few minutes, okay? Pain in left yeah, eye. Okay. Pain in left eye for a week, increasing in severity, and there was thinning here. And we increased his steroids. All other medicines kept the same, and he actually did perfectly fine. I'm gonna end on some of this stuff. These are some of the newer therapies that can be used for rheumatoid patients with scleritis and puck. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over all of these. I'm just gonna mention the slides, but there's a lot of work going on with these things. Rituximab has been used successfully by a lot of people. Hydroxychloroquine, um, unknown mechanism, but can work. I don't usually use it. Um, tumor necrosis factor inhibitors I use a lot and I work in conjunction with rheumatology. This is usually my go-to infliximab, uh, but there are patients, a fair amount of our patients on adalimumab that are also doing well. And uh, sometimes you can just go to maximum dose with your rheumatologist of infliximab and uh, you know use methotrexate and get them off the steroids. This is a newer class of drugs that's being used, these JAK inhibitors. I have no experience using them as of yet. Um, this is an interesting clinical trials. It's going to be run out of France by the NIH, and it's looking at scleritis, but will probably have implications for puck. And it's looking at infliximab versus cyclophosphamide. My guess is it's, a, it's about a four-year study. Infliximab will show some good results. I've been using it already about 10, eight, eight or nine years. Why is puck important? Because there's an incidence of melts. About you know 15% of cases will melt. There are very good studies in the literature going back almost 20 years now.
on immunosuppression. People worry about the malignancy risk. I was asked to do a commentary. It's actually very rare. There's an excess of malignancy in the immunosuppressed group, but very minimal. Skip this. So the treatment algorithm depends on how, how severe the cases are. And uh, as I said, I'm happy to share the slides. Again, some of the indications for bilateral and patients that have severe systemic disease, some of the uh, dosing, some of the monoclonal antibodies and some of the studies that have shown their benefit. We didn't get into too much. I mentioned briefly resection. I told you about glue. I mentioned flaps. We talked about membranes. You're going to end up on some of these patients doing grafts. So that has to be in the armamentarium. And in summary, you got to recognize the process, how it develops, understand etiologies, make sure you're not dealing with infection, manage the patients aggressively, include your rheumatology service in your methods, and know what the current treatments are and work with your uh, colleagues. You need a multidiscipline approach for these cases. Thank you for the time. I know I did about an hour instead of 30 minutes. I never can get through this in 30 minutes, but uh, I got about 15 patients waiting. I'm happy to take one or two quick questions, but I thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Douglas, thank you so much. Uh, as a trigger question, because you know, we have a residency training program here, well recognized. Uh, I know it depends on the patient, but as a general rule, when you have a patient like this, usually when you decide conjunctival debridement and when you decide conjunctival flap, as a general rule. Yes, as a general rule, I will try to do the medical therapies before I go to surgery in these cases. If in the first few weeks I'm not getting result, I will do a resection and sometimes debride that area. But I will say that in the last five years, having these great new biologics and high dose steroids during the initiation phase, I have not had to do a lot of surgery. I usually get these patients through with some glue, plus or minus a membrane and medical therapy. So perhaps just one question, Maria Julia, Francisco, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Douglas. We, we, we truly appreciate your class. Maria Julia, yes. please, or Francisco. Uh, I have a question. Yes, Dr. Uh, okay. well, thank you very much for your presentation. It was excellent. I have a question about rosacea. Uh, I mean, I usually see uh, that patients who have more severe skin rosacea, I mean, with uh, papules and pustules and rhinophema, tend to have more severe ophthalmic signs. Do you see the same? I see the exact same thing. Uh, I, have a, I have a niece that has scarred corneas from rosacea. So I've been following this disease for a long time and it's, it really is undiagnosed because a lot of people put the patient at the lamp. They don't look at the face. The lights are low. But yeah, those patients tend to have more severe disease. Now, it's not that common to get PUK in rosacea, but I have a few cases already. Okay, thank you very much. The last question, Maria Julia, please. You can question. hear me. No, I was. I want to ask if he uses tacrolimus because he he always mentions cyclosporine in rosacea. I always use cyclosporine, but I don't know if he uses tacrolimus also. That is tacrolimus, tacrolimus in drops or systemic tacrolimus. So, I've used both, and I I think it's uh, it's definitely should be considered in the armamentarium. One of the guys I worked with, Steve Kaufman, his thesis was on tacrolimus, or when I worked at my previous job as chair, he used a lot more tacrolimus because Steve liked to use that with a lot of his uh, autoimmune diseases of the cornea. So there's definitely a role and uh, it, is, it is something that should be considered. I don't use a lot of cyclosporin. There's a slide, you know, you can use, there's a higher dose obviously of cyclosporin currently available. And some people will advocate for that as well. I don't have a huge amount of experience using topical because I think this disease, you really need to control systemically rather than topically. Okay, 
D Professor Douglas, thank you so much for joining us. It was a truly pleasure. All the best and be thank safe. Thank you for having me and have a great rest of the day. I appreciate the invitation to speak, Pablo and everyone else. All the best, all the best, all, all the best, best for you. Care. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Okay. Thank you. Professor Gassiragi, thanks. Professor Gassiragi. Ok, seguí Javier, no sé los tiempos. Agradecemos todo. Largo. Pero excelente. Largo, pero bueno. No, bueno, yo les comento, él es una autoridad eh, en la córnea americana, pero aparte, eh, como les comenté, eh, él durante muchos años manejó una de las residencias más grandes de los Estados Unidos, está en el board, son estudiosos de la córnea, tienen otra visión, a mí la verdad que me emociona escucharlos, me encanta, eh, fíjense lo que publican, la claridad conceptual, los casos que nos mostró, es toda una vida de sacar fotografías y querer compartir, la verdad que a, mí, a mí yo estoy... Súper feliz. Excelente. Gracias Excelente, a todos. Pablo. No sé, no sé de Excelente. Pablo si hay tiempo para que dé la clase, no sé, Javier. Creo que él sí va a banco, Javier. Si no, lo damos para el, el próximo Ateneo, tal vez. Perdón, Todavía Pablo. Sí, para el próximo, Pablo. Ok, Pablo. No sé si está vale. Javier, así que cierro yo el Ateneo de la Cátedra de Oftalmología de la UBA. Nos vemos el próximo miércoles. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Chao. Chao, chao. Chao, chao. Chao, chao. Gracias, Mati. Thank mm -hmm. you.